with this. Well, unified featherweight champion Amandia Serrano took to her social media and said, I'm going to start building on this record come June 11th. I'll be fighting more consistently for Icon Fights. I want to help grow the company and alongside my co-manager, Pearl Gonzalez. Pearl Gonzalez, who is a mixed martial artist herself. We will help build it up to the level that all others will know what who is Icon? Oh. On a separate post in reference to a separate conversation, Amandia Serrano said, If it wasn't for my team, things would be crazy. I literally made more money on my upcoming mixed martial arts fight sponsors than some of my past boxing fights. Thank God that's changed for me, and the numbers got way better in boxing. Truth be told, nowhere near the men, but I get you. Are you getting the sense she's ever going to fight Katie Taylor? No, I'm not. And I'm beginning to wonder if she is going to unify the featherweight division the way she said she would. I told you guys before, this endeavor in the mixed martial arts by way of icon fights leaves me with the impression that things have slowed down in reference to those unification talks with the newly crowned WBA featherweight champion Erica Cruz and the current reigning IBF featherweight champion Sarah Mifud. If Amandia Serrano has enough time on her hands to start delving into the world of mixed martial arts once again, it's likely because things in boxing have slowed down. I mean, that's why she decided to do what she did before. It is. When she said... Years ago. I believe it was in 2018, before signing that deal with Matchroom. When she said that she'd done all that she could do in the sport of boxing and her plan was to dedicate her full time and attention to the sport of mixed martial arts. Oh. That appears to be what's going on here. It appears that plan has resumed. We see how many times Amandia Serrano references finance as, as a motivator, the great motivator. I don't hold that against her. I really don't. We've all got a job to do. We've all got to do it. We've got to keep the lights on however we can. I understand. Yeah. I don't actually fault Amandia Serrano for trying to make something of herself in the sport of mixed martial arts, but it's the divisiveness that chaps my ass. I mean, the real question here is, has Amandia Serrano, so far, with everything she's done... So far. ...since turning down that Katie Taylor fight, since walking away from that engagement, has she made the kind of money, with all these separate endeavors and all these different fights, has she made the amount of money doing all those different things that she would have made fighting Katie Taylor once? You know the answer. You do. Do you think she made fighting Diana Santana? Do you think she made fighting Daniela Bermudez? And do you think that she will make fighting whoever it is she's fighting on this icon card? Do you think she's going to make with any of those fights what she stood to make with Katie Taylor? Hell, if you put the combined prices of all of those fights together, do you think it would add up to what she stood to make with Katie Taylor? You know the answer. There's a prevalent theme in the American boxing scene, and it's not exclusive to the girls. The guys are guilty of this too, some of them. That theme is entitlement. A lot of fighters that just really aren't realistic about what their marquee value is and, and what makes sense for those who actually are flipping the bill, those who actually are financing the fights. I talked to Heather Hardy several months ago, and in so many words, Heather Hardy let me know that she was offered a world title opportunity. She was offered a title shot by way of matchroom. Fighter. Um, I was offered a fight with Terry in, in February, and there was a little bit of Twitter talk. I thought it was super exciting, and I was over $20,000 for it. And it's like I said before. I mean, $20,000 at this point in my career is almost like a break-even, which doesn't sound like that. But when you consider 30% of it is going to go to my corner, 30 to 35% goes to my corner. Now we go from 20000 to about 13000 I'm looking at four to five thousand right off the bat in taxes. That's going down to eight thousand. And when I sacrifice the amount of work that I'm going to have to sacrifice, as a fighter who knows what it means to sacrifice my body, my brain, my time away from my daughter, is four thousand dollars worth it to fight for a world title in someone's backyard when A, I'm not a knockout puncher. And B, I'd have to do everything but fucking tap dance on Eddie Hearn's grandmother's grave to get the win. She turned that title shot down. She didn't like the money. You fast forward a couple of months, she ends up fighting... Jessica Kamara. She ends up losing the fight. She loses the fight. So what you have to ask yourself is, had she taken up that opportunity for Matchroom to fight for a title in victory or defeat... Would she have made more money than what she just made losing to Jessica Kamara? You know the answer. Between the Serrano fight of 2019 and the Kamara fight of this year, 
Heather Hardy was afforded an opportunity to fight by way of matchroom, and it would have been for a world title. I vaguely recall the purse amount being something to the tune of $25,000, something along those lines. Heather didn't like the money. She turned the fight down. So what you have to ask yourself is, did she make anything to the tune of $25,000 fighting Jessica Kamara? I don't think so. I don't. Granted, that she probably would have lost that title fight last year. Who knows? It's the sport of boxing. Theater of the unexpected. Maybe she would have won. Maybe. You see what Mauricio Lara did to Josh Warrington, right? He capitalized on that opportunity, so you never know until you know. Hindsight, however, that's 2020. You turned down a six-figure payday by way of matchroom to fight for a title so that you can fight Jessica Kamara a year later and lose for less money? It's her prerogative. She's a grown woman. She can do what she wants. Though on the face of it, it does look a lot like she costed herself a lot of money being a hardliner. Could have had that title fight last year. Maybe you lose that fight. You could have still fought Jessica Kamara this year uh... as a rebound fight. Then maybe you wouldn't have approached that Kamara fight off such a long layoff. You know, maybe you lose that title fight, but it still keeps you sharp. You go into that Kamara fight, you rebound, you get two paydays instead of one. That's not what happened. It's a prevalent theme with American fighters. You see what just happened with Michael Huntor and Philippe Hergovic. Michael didn't like the money for that Philippe Hergovic fight. He decided to enter into some kind of multi-fight arrangement with the people over there at Triller. And who knows how that's gonna work out. But the real prize, as it were, associated with the Philippe Hergovic fight wasn't the fight itself or the purse that comes with it. It was the opportunity to become the IBF's mandatory challenger because at minimum, you know, the IBF are going to hit the gas on that and you'll get your shot or you'll get your belt. He passed on that for, I guess, what's supposed to be a little bit more money than, you know, what he would have made with uh, Philippe Hergovic. But it certainly wouldn't have been as much money as he could have made fighting Anthony Joshua in victory or defeat. He chose what he chose. As did Heather Hardy. As did Amanda Serrano. Based on what I'm seeing here, the theme is entitlement. There's no other way to describe it, no other way to put it. These fighters that have very limited options, they get around somebody like Eddie Hearn, and they turn their nose up at money that they don't normally make. They turn their nose up at this money. Yeah. They start talking about how they're being lowballed even though they don't make this kind of money. Once again, that's their choice. It's their prerogative. It is. They can do what they want. So you can't do that and say that you're being mistreated. You can't do that and say that you're being lowballed when you readily accept lesser purse amounts Less money. on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, it's not a lowball if you don't make that money on a regular basis. And it just is what it is. It appears that Amandia Serrano is going to be taking a more active role in the octagon as opposed to what she told everybody before about unifying the division, becoming its undisputed champion in the hopes that that would increase her value to Eddie Hearn to thereby get her a bigger payday for a Katie Taylor fight. I told you guys before, I'll tell you guys again. I don't think that fight's ever going to happen. It might not. The story now is Katie might be fighting her amateur rival of France, Estelle Mosley. Not Amanda Serrano, not even Jessica McCaskill, who I thought was a shoe in for the fight. Now Amanda's talking about taking a more active role over there at Icon Fights, building upon her mixed martial arts record. Thus, her plan from 2018 has resumed. That's what I was expecting after the Taylor fight fell apart. In spite of the sycophants, you'll find under Amandia Serrano's tweets, in spite of sympathizer channels here on YouTube who pretend to give a damn about women's boxing, in spite of all of this, this is what I figured would happen. She's just gonna get back to doing what she planned on doing before. She doesn't really wanna know what would happen if she shared the ring with Katie Taylor. She doesn't want to know. Even if her fans do. When fights don't happen in the sport of boxing, it's a black eye on the sport. It doesn't help the sport along the way Amandia Serrano would have you believe. This stand that she's taking. Please. That ain't nothing but plain old virtue signal. This ain't about morals, it's about money. And hear and understand, same black man will sign the match room and did not get an opportunity from Anthony Joshua, okay? That same man, that's who Wilder gave an opportunity to, right? Because they shared a common issue, which was their sick daughters. So he gave one black Cuban, Afro-Cuban, an opportunity who was down and out and couldn't get an opportunity. Signed to how many promoters was... Hold on, don't cut me off, because you, you're definitely wrong. Luis Ortiz was signed to Golden Boy. He didn't get an opportunity with Golden Boy. Luis Ortiz was signed to Matchroom. He didn't get an opportunity with Matchroom. Luis Ortiz got an opportunity with Deontay Wilder, a black man. Twice. 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 Yeah. And then who else did Wilder? Because he's showing you a pattern. I gave, you know, 
uh, Malik Scott an opportunity when all of you guys laughed and said, hey, that was your friend you were fighting? Maybe it was his friend, Spencer, because look at where they are today. But guess what he did for his fucking friend? Gave him an opportunity. Isn't there? You're the historian. Now give my audience a history lesson. Who's the, who's the, the famous black fighter that said, if you're my friend, give me a shot. Help me get rich. I'm paraphrasing. You give us the right quote. You give us the right, because Wilder's given, Wilder is given his, Wilder, Wilder, no, before you answer, I'm telling you, Wilder, Wilder is giving his friends opportunities. Now, you give us the history lesson. Who was the great boxer who said that, who said that many years ago? So, Joe Lewis is great for saying it, but Wilder's a dickhead for saying it, for doing it, for doing it. He's doing it. He's not saying it. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it, though, right? He also gave a Mexican an opportunity, right? Didn't he give a Mexican areola an opportunity, too? It looks like he's given a lot of minorities an opportunity. The traveler and the gypsy, the Mexican, the Afro-Cuban, the black man. Oh, you understand that? Okay, okay. No, you're right. You're right. I guess. I guess we can all twist it. I guess. No, I'm not twisting. They get opportunity because he knows he can beat him. In his mind, it's right. You know why Dillian White didn't get an opportunity? Him and why? Dillian because they have something personal. And oh, um, shut up, man. All right. Because the personal. All right. He didn't all right. White. And here we have another chapter in the same book. Another chapter where Deontay Wilder is supposed to be given special consideration, special credit for having fought Luis Ortiz. Why? Nestor Gibbs of The Boxing Voice, a very hardworking man. I respect his work ethic, though I do not agree with many of his views. Nestor Gibbs would have you believe that a fighter like Luis Ortiz was deprived of an opportunity with Anthony Joshua to face him, an opportunity that he was entitled to when nothing could be further from the truth. And we've touched on this many times here on the channel. I guess we're gonna have to touch on it again. Ahead of what was to be, the Anthony Joshua versus Vladimir Klitschko fight. Years ago. That fight involved the vacant WBA title, the newly vacated WBA title. And ahead of that fight, Anthony Joshua already had a mandatory by way of the IBF. The IBF was the first title he ever picked up. You all know he picked it up from Charles Martin. Now, he approached that fight with a mandatory already waiting, but because it was a unification match, an exemption was given. After having won the fight, he still had that IBF mandatory waiting, and he adopted Luis Ortiz as oh. his mandatory challenger as well. This created a dilemma that required reconciliation from both sanctioning bodies, both the IBF and the WBA. Gilberto Mendoza, the WBA president himself, touched on that and said he was going to get up with Daryl Peebles and work out a rotation, which they did. The IBF's mandatory would come first because that's the first belt that Anthony Joshua won, and he already had that mandatory waiting before he became the WBA champion. So the IBF's mandatory would come first, and the WBA's would come second. WBA's mandatory was Luis Ortiz. Now, Luis Ortiz, he didn't want to wait, and I don't blame him, because he was an old guy then. He's an even older guy now. You're old. After all of that happens... You're old. Luis Ortiz is afforded a world title shot, a world title opportunity, with Deontay Wilder. Ah. An opportunity that he took. Now, bear in mind, this time he was still entitled to his world title opportunity, his title shot for the WBA title with Anthony Joshua. All he would have had to do was wait for Anthony Joshua to satisfy his mandatory challenger, which subsequently became Carlos to come after Pulev pulled out. Better still, all he would have had to do was wait. That's it. And he would have been the next guy in line. He chose not to wait. He chose to take up Wilder on his offer. Then he pisses hot. Ahead of the Wilder fight, he tests positive for a banned substance, is subsequently stricken from the WBA's rank standings, this having been the second time a banned substance was found in a system. He manages to work things up with the WBC, however. The fight goes on, Luis Ortiz loses the fight, and the rest is history. But that's not all, folks. Beyond all of that, Anthony Joshua offered this guy a world title shot, a world title opportunity, after Jerome Miller pissed hot. And Luis Ortiz's team, in some way, some form, they fumbled the ball. They fumbled the opportunity. Nesta Gibbs knows that because they came on his show to talk about it. Oh. Now, there was a disconnect between Luis Ortiz, his trainer, and his manager. His manager wanted to be a hardliner. They offered Luis Ortiz something like, I don't know, six, seven million dollars. They fucked it up. They fumbled the bag. But, you know, Nesta would have you believe that Wilder is this benevolent being for doing what the fuck he's supposed to do exactly. as a fighter. 
It's not an act of kindness. It's not charity that Deontay Wilder is fighting with these fighters. It's he's not supposed to do that. What he's not telling you is that Luis Ortiz already had his eyes on Wilder before he had his eyes on Joshua. From 2016 and onward, there was a growing demand for Deontay Wilder to fight Luis Ortiz because Luis Ortiz had expressed interest in fighting him. Oh. Wilder at first was not receptive to this idea, though he ultimately ended up fighting Luis Ortiz as a voluntary credit to him. But I reiterate, this is often blown out of proportion by Deontay Wilder's fans, by Deontay Wilder's supporters who think it's this benevolent act of God, this charity, that Wilder fought someone who could fight back? Wow. I guess it's an act of charity when he does it because he doesn't normally do that. If you're going to try to sell me this notion that Deontay Wilder is the mother Teresa of the heavyweight division for affording those guys those opportunities, you could pretty much make that argument for Anthony Joshua and Canelo Alvarez and a lot of guys. Oh, Wilder gave a Cuban guy an opportunity. Oh, Anthony Joshua gave a Bulgarian guy an opportunity. And he gave a guy from Cameroon an opportunity. And even though he's bitter rivals with Dillian White, he still fucking fought that guy. I guess he gave him an opportunity too, whereas Deontay Wilder wouldn't give Dillian White the time of day. And Nestor Gibbs himself had to acknowledge that. I mean, this job they're putting on Wilder is a spin job you could spin for almost anybody. Anthony Joshua didn't use hard feelings as a reason not to fight. The way that Nesta Gibbs does for Deontay Wilder, he acknowledges that there's a personal rift between them, but Anthony Joshua, unlike Wilder, he used that personal rift as a reason to fight, whereas Wilder seems to have used it as a reason not to fight. And this is your king. This is your leader. Your modern day Muhammad Ali. You think Muhammad Ali would have did some shit like that? My fucking ass Muhammad Ali would have did some shit like that. Well, there ain't no Ali.